Hello, my name is Alexander Morari, and I'm the founder of ITK Media. You've tuned to our ITK Media podcast about Central and Eastern European startups that are in pre-series A stage. I now can say that these companies are the promising companies from the region. Our guest today uh, is uh, Karen Burns, the founder of FIMA, or FIMA, or FUMA, depending on where you come from. Uh, the company has been pronounced differently, but we prefer uh, FIMA. So that's a SaaS platform that enables cameras to become smart data collecting sensors in a safe and secure way. Hello, Karen. Hi. Look, as a warm up, um, let's start with very easy questions. What is intelligent video mm -hmm. surveillance for you? So we don't use the word surveillance because we do not look after individual uh, people. We don't do face recognition and so forth. Um, we merely look at objects. So for our AI brain that we have built, there is no difference whether it's looking at a truck or a person or a bicycle. Um, it looks at it as an object, counts how many of those objects there are, how close they are to each other, uh, what's their density, how long they stay in the frame and so forth. Being able to do this in real time and at scale, that is intelligent. And it's a scalable solution because there are cameras have been standardized across the world. The codecs are the same basically globally. And so it's very easy to, to go and, and set it up anywhere. So your solution is part of the video surveillance. It's just on the end, like like it's an it's an it's an addition to what's been used for several years now. And mostly I understand you work with the CCTV hardware and the CCTV yeah. infrastructure, okay. And you know, it's just mm -hmm. for those who don't know, CCTV is all the cameras you see in the public spaces or private properties and so on. And this is closed circuit television. And yes. of course, as one of the oldest forms of video surveillance uh, used, it still remains the most effective today. And what you're trying to do mm -hmm. is basically upgrade the hardware or the, the, I mean, the hardware software that, which is used right now to a different level, right? and to give this uh, big data, data analytics kind of uh, layer on top of uh, generally widely used um, solution, okay? Mm -hmm. And let me ask so you- we be... Yes, go on. Yeah, go ahead. No, I actually Let... wanna say, we want to make the camera into a superhero, a like data gathering superhero machine. Because at the moment what happens oh, is, okay. there are millions, millions of cameras globally um, that are just looking at things, you know, looking at the videos, video streams. But they're only used when something happens and to look after to look at it after the fact. Okay, so this happened. And this it's not really any any use. Uh, and at the same time, we are putting in IoT sensors, radar sensors, infrared sensors, 3D sensors to do the same kind of stuff. There are so many devices around us. What's the point of adding any more when we have this really well connected CCTV or security camera network already available? but nobody will ever be able to sit behind the screen and just look at what's happening. But then an, an AI can take that position, look at the camera feeds and understand what's happening and give back real-time data on the analytics yeah. of what it sees. Yeah, yeah. So as as we're still in the warm-up kind of stage of uh, this podcast, let me ask the same question with a different angle. What is the ethical video surveillance for you? So for me, ethical, for us as a company, we do not do any sort of privacy infringement. And privacy, we basically take our baseline as the European GDPR or the General Data Protection Regulation. And so we have actually been working with a legal team and with the Estonian Data Protection Agents, the government regulator for data privacy, oh, okay. to make sure that we do not infringe on people's rights. Before we launch a new use case with a client, we actually go and check with the regulator. Can we do this? We check with our legal team. Can we do this? So how how can we make sure that we're not infringing on anybody's rights? That's why there is in the middle of our uh, website as well, a pledge for privacy. And that's something we do not do. It we, we, we can't even enable it. So if a police department would come to us and, and ask for video footage, we don't have any, we don't keep any of it. Uh, okay, so at the back end, you do not have the opportunity to derive the... No. The, looks or the appearance of a specific person no but can no, you we, we just instance, don't keep it yeah yeah okay so with this let's uh like jump back into the scenario uh, that we have and round one solution in a nutshell explain your solution is it pure software and SaaS solution or do you have any hardware behind as well so no hardware whatsoever uh most 
most cameras nowadays have a URL, so they're usually connected to a network. So all we really need is to tap into that camera feed um, and then we're able to start doing analytics. So we basically don't need to install any kind of hardware and the client can set up the system themselves. So this is extremely rare for a computer vision company that you can just create an account, add your camera in, draw the virtual sensors or the counters on the screen that you want to start looking at and voila, it, it takes literally under a minute to set one camera up. And whenever we do demos, clients are amazed at how easy it is. There's no setup fee, no like installation yeah. fee, none of that. You can just go, just set it up and go. It's very easy. Ah, okay. Like like pl plug and play. From, Essentially, yes. From set go. Okay. And mm -hmm. then um, mention a couple of use cases that you have been already successful with and maybe the most promising in the future. Mm -hmm. So basically, we uh, started the whole idea and concept of Pi Mind 2019 in October, and then it was merely an idea. So we spent 2020, we took a year to test this tech in various verticals. We tested traffic counting, parking, um, retail, real estate, uh, all sorts of places. And the most, well, the successful use cases in the beginning uh, were in traffic uh, analytics, essentially. So we worked with Dubai Road and Transportation Authority. We were there as part of their Future Foundation Acceleration Program. And what they wanted to do was basically tap into the existing camera network again and understand what's happening in the street. How many buses, cars, trams, pedestrians, vehicles, how close they are to each other. So every time a bus nearly took down a bicycle, we were able to class that as a, as a dangerous event. And I can tell you in Dubai in 24 hours on one junction, there was more than 200 <laughs> of, uh, of interesting incidents that happened. Um, and we, then we imported it to Tallinn, to the capital of Estonia, where we are based, and tested this as well. So a lot of the cities at the moment use radar-based sensors. In different climates, they have a little bit of a different age, but they're expensive. So the ones here are over 3,000 euros per piece. So kitting, and they only look at one junction, oh, sorry, one uh, lane of traffic. So to look uh -huh. at the larger junction, you need a lot of money, 50, 60,000 euros to put all of the sensors up. They look at long vehicle, short vehicle. That's it. That's the that's the data you get out. We can cover a junction like that with two or three cameras that usually are there already to monitor traffic flows. And we can also do the count, counting, but we can also tell you if it's a long vehicle, it's a bus or a van or a truck. We can also tell you if it's a bicycle and we can also capture the pedestrians that might be affected by the traffic happening around them. We can look at trajectory. So in what way people move on the junction and if they're doing illegal U-turns or not, for example. So uh, the AI is self-learning. So we don't tell the AI that this is a bus lane, this is a pedestrian lane. The AI looks at the junction for two weeks and then it understands patterns. So when it sees a lot of buses only on one side of the road, it asks, okay, this must be a bus lane. If people cross over, this must be a zebra crossing. It's an intelligent solution that it is a self-teaching thing. So it's, that's why it's so easy to set up. We were only a team of four people, so we had to make it really lightweight to set up. So that was a very successful use case. And the three cameras from us would be 3.5 times cheaper than the same junction on a sensor basis for the same length of time. That's a very concrete, very successful use case. Um, other stuff that we have done is parking lot management. Again, the AI or the artificial intelligence brain is the same. Cars are still the same kinds of objects it understands, and it understands behavior. So in the, the old solutions, you would basically have to uh, manually input where the parking spaces are uh, because it's these white boxes that cars park in. And the AI detects the car moving into the space and out of the space. That's how it's able to do a count. We got rid of that completely because in Estonia, a lot of places don't have those lines. And when snow comes down, the lines you know, mm -hmm. disappear okay. completely. Plus okay. the amount of car parking spaces is reduced as people park so that there's more space to get in and out ah, of your vehicle. Okay. So what we do, we look at the behavior. So where car, so let's say AI looks, okay, last 24 hours, how did the cars park in the last 24 hours? And then it understands from that parking history, how many spaces are in the car park. And you can set that manually when you set the system up. You can tell the uh, AI to either tell you where the AI thinks the parking spaces should be. And you can set this over the last month, week, day, hour, uh, or specific number of occurrences of parking, or you can just set it manually yourself. And you can basically just, all you do is do these little circles or bubbles 
on your screen. Again, your setup. So we manage a car park of nearly 2,000 spaces uh, behind Tallinn Airport with our AI. Very easy, very lightweight thing to set up. Um, and that's one use case. However, now that I've gone through all of these ones, COVID came. So nobody parks in the offices anymore because they're all at home. Um, and uh, city governments uh, had other priorities, essentially, than looking at traffic management because of COVID. So we started testing our tech in retail and real estate. And we have realized that a very good uh, target market for us is this medium-sized shopping center that has two or three big anchor stores uh, that maybe hasn't wanted to invest in Thales, Bosch, Milestone type expensive systems, but still wants to get the analytics out. And that maybe is happy to set it up even themselves and be flexible around that. So we have uh, a couple of those uh, onboarded or about to onboard and running tests. So we're basically at the moment offering a two week uh, unpaid free, free of charge trial for them to see how FIMA would work for them. Again, because we have already trained our AI to understand traffic flows, um, we can work in a real estate park. So basically in Estonia, we're working with uh, an estate where you have uh, multiple car parks across a larger area, multiple office buildings and multiple shops. So they want to understand how that entire campus operates in terms of business, daytime, are people uh, spending enough time in the park? How long they're taking to park their car? Uh, that kind of stuff. You know, what's interesting, I understood the system is uh, built so that it can be used either in a descriptive mode, which it, which is, it describes you the normality in this specific context. And then it says, this is normal. Mm -hmm. the, the, this is a parking, yeah. this is a normal parking lot. If something is uh, at odds, it will signal you. Or yeah. you meant you just took this question off off my mind basically that it can also be prescriptive when you can tell the AI or your solution that hey this is what we call parking lots here and whenever there's a signal that it, it, it's like uh, opposite let's say somebody parks that it gives you red signals uh, I mean red flag signals yeah. right yeah yeah so and the client can set it up themselves. Yeah, so mm -hmm. Quant actually can set this themselves. They, if they want to see whether people go and do donuts between three and four in the morning, they can set an alert in their system. So basically, you know, in, in empty car parks, these uh, people, teenagers in the middle of the night, yeah, gathering and uh, driving around and that kind of stuff. So you can set an alert to see if, if somebody's doing that, for example, if there's any sort of weird behavior uh, happening, say that instead of cars, it counts 1,000 people in the car park in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. And so you actually can also uh, ask the system to count only people or only cars or both or these and essentially, yeah. Well. Okay. So we have, we have trained eight classes, so you can ask the system many of those eight. What's the pricing model and can anybody from the street to buy, a, a, let's say, access um, uh, to the data that your clients are now collecting or using? What I mean, can you resell? So no, 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 no. So the data belongs to the clients. Nobody has access to that uh, across the platform. The data belongs to the to the clients. So we would uh, not sell that data. Absolutely not. Um, the pricing model is 150 euros per camera per month. That's a fixed fee. Simple. simple. Uh, it's very simple. We, we thought let's do it tiered and <laughs> basic and this and that and I thought you know what let's just get rid of it let's do it really easy 150 euros per camera per month you pay after you have used it so we you pay at the end of the month for the days you used essentially ah, okay. um so it's self on board um and it covers uh, the setup of the organization uh, at the moment we offer unlimited amount of users so you don't pay per seat you just pay per camera um, and for we also give out an api so you can integrate the data uh, for example, into your in a shopping mall, into any of the screens, if you want to show how many people are there at the moment, into your car park, into your website, yeah, yeah. etc. cetera. Uh, our, actually, our car parking spaces are geo-adjacent tagged. So mm -hmm. if you want to navigate, not just to a car park, to a specific spot, um, yeah. you can essentially do that if you're disabled uh, and require or require an electric vehicle charging station, for example. Uh, but I digress. So that's the model. Uh, you also get counts, uh, density, so heat map and dwell time. The so dwell time meaning how long people spend in the frame. Um, and then we're at the moment working on pricing the rest of our feature sets out as well. 
So the pricing model will change, I understand, depending on how um, many... The, the basic price will remain. Uh, what will change is the extra features, for example. So if you want to add the car park on top, you'll pay a little bit extra. If you want to add uh, trajectory mapping on top, you know, so some of the stuff is still in the works. And the approach we have taken is if a client wants something, that we don't offer yet, and we can see other clients wanting it as well, we'll, we'll just develop it. So it's not something that's custom, we'll just offer it out to anybody and then charge a little bit of a bundle uh, price on top. But being a startup, that's something that we're still hacking at. Of course, of course. And look, staying within the real estate industry, so to say, or built environment as uh, we call it recently. Um, mm -hmm. Can you, uh, can the system also uh, count the number of uh, clients or visitors in the shopping center yeah yeah you know there are there's there's a plethora of solutions and mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. companies selling this solution with the hardware basically installing uh, sensors and they're okay. uh, counting people coming through the gates i mean through the main entrance and then the same way out and they do um you know they they do calculations how many went in how many out and they do all very approximate and so on mm -hmm. and you can be very precise i mean the solution can be very precise in counting the actual number of people in a shopping center as a yeah. whole on a floor yeah. in a specific area yeah. that is under the scrutiny right now by the tenant or by the shopping center yeah. mall, mall owner and so on wow amazing mm -hmm. so for example a really cool use case recently with one of our clients is that the uh, it's a big shopping mall and they have an issue that their tenants, so the shops yes. are saying visitors are down 80%. We can't pay rent this month. You need to reduce yeah. rent. COVID yes. pressures yes. are insane. Yes. So what we have done, we can see down the corridor. So obviously all anonymized, we just count the people. We can see how many people went down the corridor and how many entered the shop. Because if you can imagine a camera looking down in a corridor and we draw a line, our system is in paint program in Microsoft, you just take your mouse and you draw a line. And that line is then a sensor. It starts understanding who goes across it in which direction. Sorry, how many and in which direction. And then you can draw a line in front of each shop entrance. And you can understand how many went in, how many went out. So we discovered that actual numbers are down only 30%, not 80. So that gives the shopping center actual proper data to go and say, no, you need to either change your display or merchandising yeah, or yeah, offers yeah. or whatever you're doing. But yeah. that's not the issue right now. And here's the data to prove it. So these yeah. indoor, outdoor, entry gate stuff, absolutely. I mean, but, but they don't look at how, what people are doing in a shopping mall, which are increasingly becoming places of leisure. It's just not people in and out. It's like, how much time do you spend here? How much money do you spend here? What do you do here? So yeah. that's amazing. something amazing. That's, that's really valuable. Let me give an insight, maybe maybe you know that or not. Mm -hmm. So in real estate, you have property management uh, people that are managing the shopping mall in this case. And yeah, there are also yeah. asset management and there are basically yeah. the landlord or the owners, funds and so on. And if you can make a dotted line of uh, access to such data between property management team, asset management team, and the uh, and like final owner, sometimes investment funds, sometimes investment funds do the asset management as well. And then they will mm -hmm. be able to, to to defend their position in relations with tenants, basically, or just prove that we yeah. are successful. Maybe you could have to, yeah. change, uh, to change something. That's the that. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then it's in, in, indeed disruptive to all the counting um, uh, solutions that are now currently used in the whole real estate globally. Yeah, absolutely. Like, for example, today in Estonia, uh, as, as a measure of fighting COVID, they decided to switch off Wi-Fi in all the shopping centers. So, and as you know, a lot of people use, a lot of companies actually, or shopping malls, use the Wi-Fi network to understand how many people yeah. go in and out with their mobile phone MAC addresses. So now they're going to be blind because of all those uh, data sources being turned off. Plus, they're extremely inaccurate anyway. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a funny one that's just happened. Um, I'm not sure I will sleep well today uh, and in next days until I have a demo of the project of this of the platform. Absolutely. <laughs> because I checked, probably there are no videos yet, as yet. Maybe a little a little spots, but not quite a video showing the functionality. Or did I miss? Uh, on our website, you mean? Or yeah, yeah. Yeah, we haven't. It's one of those jokes that we make that the cobbler always goes barefoot. 
um, <laughs> you know, so it's uh, it's one of those funny ones where uh, we there's all these things that we do and and we haven't told we haven't told the world yet. We made a decision today to hire a marketing manager and we've made oh, an okay. offer. So that will change very very shortly. I mean, if I can I can share something now if this is can be part of the podcast, but yes, uh, keep going. Yeah, so this is our camera setup wizard. Very simple. Uh, it tells you what you need to do basically. So the video stream has to be accessible us, to us, yeah. and that's the main, the, the only requisite. But essentially, is a stream. So let's get started. Let's give this camera a name. So it key media. That's the name of the camera. And now uh, we have to put in a stream. So for the demo, this is telling real time cameras right now. So all the public ones. So I'm going to do um, copy image location. And that means I should be able to access the camera stream. So test connection, yes. So when I press test connection, our system starts provisioning all the GPUs, the um, AI, the algorithms, all that magic stuff kicks off. It can see the stream. Now we click continue and boom, we are live. The camera set up. So now we need to decide where we want to start counting the cameras from. I'm going to click here and then draw a line. So now we know cameras, uh, cars that turned right. Okay. So let's do another one, for example, here. Uh, so that we know how many buses were on the bus lane. Buses. Now there's a theater here. So let's count how many cars turn to the theater. Uh, in a shopping mall, you would basically do like, there we go, Massimo Dutti, for example, then yeah, how many yeah, yeah. people went into an H&M, okay. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Click OK. Done. And that's it. It's the stream up. So I added uh, this. Basically, what I showed you here is our uh, dashboard. Uh, you can add all of your camera streams here. Um, and now it starts generating data for you. Obviously, I just set it up so we don't have any historical data. Uh, I click here, you can see the camera feed and the counts. And then it just tells you what happened in the entire day, last six hours, last hour. You can select whether you want to only look at cameras, only look at, sorry, only look at buses, only look at people, only look at whatever. Um, last month, the entire time frame is kind of up to you as a user to define. And that, that's it. It's very, very simple. Amazing. Thanks a lot. I will sleep well now. Let's move on to your uh, second point <laughs> in our scenario. The round number two, competitors. There are some, yeah. So basically Deep North is a company that does something very similar to us. I don't know if they use hardware or not. It's another company in Canada called Soul Link. So they have a relatively security focus. Um, there's other ones that look at the specific behavior around uh, autonomous shops, how to enable those. Uh, a lot of security applications for computer vision and camera-based detections, obviously. Uh, but but this sort of mid-market, simple pricing, simple setup, self-service SaaS, we, we haven't seen any. I've been speaking to investors a lot, uh, obviously. I've spoken to nearly, actually over 80 now since uh, last summer. And they have said, the last chat they had as well, that they haven't seen a, a self-service SaaS model. There are computer vision solutions, obviously, out there, but but not like the one we have. So I hope it will remain like this for a while. <laughs> yeah, you have to act quick, of course, and that's why your marketing person will help, definitely. So you basically give similar results at a lesser like level of uh, hassle, right? Essentially, yes, and um, perhaps a bit of more insight as well. So, ah, you know, okay. rather than using uh, uh, rather than using just these IoT sensors or Wi-Fi counters, which are also our competitors, we're able to do a lot more in terms of who, like I told you about the corridor, how many people go in, how many out, etc. Um, but a lot of these competitors don't have enough detail about pricing. Actually, none of them publish their prices online. Mm -hmm. It's mostly around get in touch and get a quote or book a demo. Um, so it, it's hard to see what's under the bonnet or understand what really is there are they really really no infrastructure or, or do they sell you a tiny iot device that you have to plug somewhere on your network i don't know with this approach to your pricing i guess you get lots of inbound calls or requests for proposal and interest is that true would you say so yeah 
it is not uh, that heavy. Our SEO is still a little bit weak, so we do a lot of outbound. We do get inbound as well, oddly enough, from airports. Um, they're like big shopping centers with the security attached. So they're very keen to understand how people move around. I uh, do a little bit mm -hmm. of proximity detection as well to make sure that COVID restrictions are adhered to. Uh, okay. I mean, airports are so empty right now that it's not really an issue, but it will become, uh, they will become busy as soon as we can fly again. People will fly again. So yeah, yeah we have yeah. had inbound from quite interesting uh, sources. Yeah, interesting. So self-service and self, what you could say, self uh, plug and play basically approach is uh, what yeah. makes you different at all the same or even better parameters of the outcome okay great mm -hmm. karen great let's move on round three um and this time around it will be a little bit different um in the whole history of your company what would you have done differently knowing what you know now or oh, i have a very strict policy of not working with should haves and could haves it's something i do in private life and business life as well um Good. Yes. So basically, uh, yeah, it, it's, I think we've done really well. Actually, I'm really proud. So in a year and what, four months, we have raised $2.1 million with a team of four people. We've built this. We've only started hiring in January, so a month ago. So I think we've done really well. I'm proud of myself. I probably would not have done anything different. So I'm going to pat myself on the back and the team. Uh, I have a brilliant co-founder, Davi. So I think we, we have done really well. But is, is there any lesson you might share? I mean, you you want to share with mm -hmm. fellow founders in all this adventure? Uh, like, yes, uh, absolutely. What, which one? Yes, yeah, so fundraising. So I spoke to 70 investors last summer. So that was extremely intense. Um, and I did it a little bit wrong. So it was basically, I spoke to everybody I could get a hold of, which meant that uh, I was like applying to all the jobs in the world and having to write a different CV for each, essentially, mm -hmm. rather than thinking, what are my skills as a company? What's my market? What am I going to be after? And only speaking to those that are really relevant to me and can yeah. give me what I need from them. So that would have been something that I should, we should have probably invested a little bit more time into rather than just speaking to like a hundred hours of pitching calls which was which was insane who was creating the pipeline for vc interaction yourself or tavi i mean who was the first on the front line me okay yeah okay so, so i did the pipeline yeah so what you actually say is um not to focus on the money but also money plus and this plus is very important money plus means yeah absolutely the, you know what i mean like excitement of getting funded will will evaporate in a month or two or three but then you want yeah. your investors to be yeah. smart partners not just like money cushions right yeah yeah that's one of the reasons we went after angel funding as well so we were uh -huh. initially we thought we don't want any angels because it's going to mess up the cap table but we had really great offers from former uh, TransferWise first employees, actually. The very first employee they had, Trin. Uh, she's one of our uh, angel investors. And the, the gentleman who built up their entire like tech and development team in multiple areas, he's our investor as well. Um, a gentleman called Christian, whose uh, company Katana just raised $11 million uh, a round as on the, on the board and an investor. So their advice is extremely hands-on because they have been in the yeah. trenches. They built it. They, they are able to tell us just a lot of, a lot of insight that would not be able to get from an institutional investor. They're fantastic. And also obviously the VC funds as well, they, they do bring their network. Uh, so we never wanted just to get money and they all bring something to the table. Look, uh, they, they they are startup founders and venture capitals from Estonia, and that's already a compliment. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, we've done really well. Five unicorns now, I think, with Pipe Drive. Great. Karen, let's move on to round four, the company. So you mentioned already that the company was founded in 2019. You were two founders, yourself and Tavi, uh, the CTO, I understand, plus two people. And who are the rest of the team? I mean, what essentially is it developers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So developer data science, obviously, because okay. of the AI component. We have uh, PhDs, uh, data scientists in the team now as well, yeah. Uh, marketing, uh, design. Again, because it's a self-service uh, portal, 
it needs to be really intuitive and easy. So we're turning something that's very deep tech into something that you can just set up for yourself and the user experience and the flow and the kind of, um, that needs to be really, really nice and simple. Yeah, so yeah, our first hire is. actually mm-hmm. after the initial team was a product designer, which is maybe a funny one, but it was precisely because of that. Okay, great. And do you use any um, freelancers or um, part-timers as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was our uh, very first uh, policy. If we need somebody to come in and do a concrete piece of work, and we maybe don't need them after three or six months, we won't. We are not going to like bring in a full-time employee. We're going to find the best consultant we can. And then if we see the need for that position, we will hire, get them to do a knowledge transfer, explain to them what needs to be done, and they can take the knowledge and carry on. So we have PR agents in London, CFO in Amsterdam, uh, a lead development agency in Ukraine that we work with. So we're actually a lot bigger than just the team in Tallinn. Thanks oh, wow, to the collaborators. And yeah, so we're nearly so 16 not- people if you count all of the, those guys in as well. Interesting. So you do not take on board full-time employees, but rather um, somewhat somewhat more expensive, definitely. But for a specific period of yeah. time, you hire specialists, like top-notch specialists in their areas. Yeah, yeah, because they deliver quicker. And then if they don't deliver, the uh, divorce is so much easier <laughs> because uh, there's no hard feelings, you know, services, yeah. this or that. There's measurements, KPIs, OKRs it's just so it, it made so much sense and it kind of gives us a little bit of a super speed in certain yes, areas amazing. that we need to okay. accelerate so that's that's how we have a approach building the company yeah 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 and that's like uh, like full like your your sales are just blown blown with uh, stronger winds from different directions interesting and mm-hmm. tell me so a couple of outsourced services um were provided by people not from what you could say cost like you know like cost-efficient uh, um, regions. You mentioned what? Amsterdam. You mentioned uh, London. Mm-hmm. London. How come? Yep. Yeah. H- how come? Um, they are uh, so basically, these have or, been people. Yeah. These have been people. So again, we have reached out to our current VC network and asked for advice. Mm. Who would you re- recommend us to work with? Who can you introduce to us? Uh, and also, there's a there's an organization in Estonia called the Startup Leaders Club. So several uh, co-founders are members there. So there's 130 and growing team of startup founders. We all help each other out. If there's talent available or a really good company we worked with, we share it and say, look, they, they, they're great guys. You should work with them as well. So thanks to this Estonian startup uh, kind of community really helping each other out, it's a great resource to find the people to work with. And by the way, it's not always more expensive, we have found. Estonian salaries have been growing so hard, like so, so quickly. Uh, we are now finding that it's uh, more efficient and cheaper for us to have that PR agency in London than having a full-time press person sitting in Tallinn. Ha, huh, interesting. Are you hiring right now? We are, yes. On what roles? So we're hiring into business development and we're always on the lookout for a senior back-end developer. So software development, this is a skill that can always apply um, to FIMA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for for developers and software developers, so do you have any procedure for the recruitment pro- uh, for the recruitment uh, uh, activities? Mm-hmm. Do you have a like specified procedure, or you just go by your guts and uh, one or one or two no, tests? No, we always have a yeah, yeah. There's a test assignment that they have to respond to. They're essentially, the way we do it, we scroll out with a blanket uh, call. Same for data scientists, actually. Those can always apply as well, specifically in the computer vision field, because it's very hard to find people with that expertise. Um, and then we do a 30 minute screening call, so 30 minute tops. This is just to assess people's mindset, cultural fit, which is really key for us to build a strong team, uh, and cultural fit trump skills. So if you have the skills, but you're not the cultural fit, you won't get hired. You have to fit with the mindset and and, and be adaptable and a learner, then it, then, then it will work. Uh, there's a test assignment. We review it very quickly. We give usually three to five days to people to get get it back to us. Uh, when the test assignment is um, looks good, we have another screening call, uh, and then we make our decisions. It's usually quite quick, and we do check on references as well. Hiring, however, into business development and marketing, we've done it differently. So screening call is the same. But the test assignment we have come up with is a 100-day plan for FIMA. 
So if you had the chance to come and be really creative here within your field, what would 100 days with us for you look like? And so that essentially tells us how systematic people are, how they're thinking, are they self-driven? Can they run with this? Because in a startup, stuff might change all the time. So you have to be really quickly adaptable and you can't get stuck in a rigid plan. There, that's a pitch for new employees or new team members, basically. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Let's move on to the final round, Formula Formula F3, or as we call mm -hmm. it, Funding for the Future. Now, the total funding was around $2.1 million. Yeah. The seed round was closed in December 2020. Congratulations. And among investors, there are what companies, uh, VCs as uh, 7%, Decacor and Lemonade Stand, Tiny VC. Did I mention everybody? Yeah. Okay. Change VC, the biggest investor was Change uh, Venture Capital, ah. which is uh, a big pan Baltic fund operating across the Baltic states. Pan Baltic, yeah. And based in Estonia. They're based actually uh, in Riga and in Estonia as well. So mm. based in the Baltics as well. Fantastic fund and, and really brilliantly run, very supportive. Yeah, yeah. So this, this, this investment, um, you plan to rely on, let's say, for how long, what's the runway, and uh, do you plan the next round, and when would be the good moment for you? Mm -hmm. So we have been uh, quite conservative in the way we use money, uh, because myself and Davi come from a consulting background. So we don't believe in having a ping pong table just for the sake of it in the office and then stuff like that. Um, so we want to invest obviously in people's development and in the best skill set that we can get. Uh, so the runway is relatively long. So we still have 18 months um, happily to go. Uh, we will, however, uh, likely start to raise in the first quarter of next year. Yeah, okay. And what's the, like, what's the most ambitious plan for the next round? Uh, do you have an idea of how much this could be and uh, when you th you would say you are ready to go for a round A? Mm -hmm. uh, not yet. It's probably going to be a pre-A or, or a bridge. Um, oh, okay. Again, just like you said, we only just completed the, a round of financing. Uh, so this the, the kind of size of tickets that we're going to go after with the size of the pot of money uh, will become clearer in quarter three of this year as, as we kind of see traction, uh, average purchase, average contract uh, value, uh, so forth. So uh, data needs to inform um, what we're looking at because we want to basically get the company valuation up uh, quite high. So that's why we're looking at patenting our technology as well and so forth so that uh, we, we really have value and IP protected. Have you been selling already the solution? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We already have ARR, which is growing month on month. Is there isn't there a contradiction between patenting and selling? As soon as you are selling, this is not patentable. What do you mean? The, the company the solution mean? is in the market, and you get revenue. You derive a revenue from a solution. It cannot be patented. Isn't that so? Mm, not according to our lawyers. <laughs> so we are still. Uh, we haven't received our patents yet, so we're still in the process of this and looking at it. Ah, I uh, perhaps it, it, it yeah, yeah, not not yet. So it's perhaps unusual for a startup, but it's something that uh, we have started uh, with already as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, you did not start it right now. You started before selling, right? You applied before. Yeah, selling? yeah, 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 yeah. yeah ah, then yeah, okay, yeah, you're yeah, covered. Yeah. Okay, sure, sure. Sorry, I just uh, thought uh, mm -hmm. I would give you a heads up there. Karen, yes, great, N nice chat. Uh, like very simple to grasp and understand the value proposition as well. And your pricing model is brilliant mm -hmm. because it's simple. I really like that. And do you have any plans for the exit um, if you want to exit the company? When and why and how? Mm -hmm. So we have uh, discussed this in the team. And obviously when you've just raised money and you're building something, it's not, you don't want to sell it yet. It's your baby and then your kind of big project that you're working on. Uh, of course, we have dreams of one day being investors ourselves and giving back to the community the same way our angels have done to us. So the uh, TransferWise and Katana uh, guys who are our angels, obviously they've been able to exit and, and have been able to fund us. So I want to be able to do that one day as well, uh, but not until five years have passed. We really want to build traction and kind of put our bigger footprint down so that we'd be able to do that. So there we have it. Your long-term plan, plan is to become a VC yourself. 
and uh, and then reinvest. I understand part yeah. of the proceeds and after the exit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. Karen, thanks a lot. That was amazing. Mm -hmm. And thank you for debuting the live uh, share screen and showing the product. Basically, I never had the Let's courage. Works. <laughs> I never had the courage, <laughs> or you know, the the maybe like the appropriate guest, basically. So thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for your time and for the opportunity as well. We'll be looking forward uh, to more successes from you and keep uh, track, of course, of your successes on ITP Media website and maybe in a year or so, mm -hmm. just before pre-A, because we do not cover uh, A after A round. Uh, in the okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, mm -hmm. you Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Yeah, so that was Karen Burns from a startup doing making actually some a little revolution in the CCTV and um, video surveillance markets. And you know by her energy and drive that she, Karen actually burns her way through this market. And what an easy, simple idea basically to implement on the hardware and infrastructure already existent. That, I mean, the pricing probably will be changing a lot, definitely. And uh, I'm looking forward to see how the solution and product develops and uh, we'll keep uh, in touch with them and of course share on our uh, website and maybe a video before the round A as well. All the best. That's it for now, but there's more to come. Bye-bye. <laughs>